Uh, well, good evening, church. How are we feeling tonight? Uh, well, thank you for awesome intro and just for having us here in Syracuse. It is uh, an absolute privilege and a blessing to be able to speak to you tonight. Uh, so once again, my name is Lynn Cucino. This is my incredible, amazing, beautiful, beautiful wife, Gayle <laughs> Cucino. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's great to be able to come back after, as Dave mentioned, a year on the mission field and share a little bit of our experience there with you. Um, you know, uh, a lot happens in a year. Am I right? Yeah. I'm sure a lot of us went through many things in a year. I'm looking at it, some of you now, and I know <laughs> you've been through some things. <laughs> Uh, but you know, that's how we grow. Yeah. That's how we grow. And, the, and the, the charge given to us tonight is growth given by the Spirit. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, when you first start anything, like a church, let's say, mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of things that you just don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, yeah, that was very true in our first year in Philadelphia. There's a lot of figuring things out. Everything was new. We had never done that before. There's a bit of a learning curve. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, this is true with everything we do in life. Yeah. Right? So you start a new job. You got to figure it out all over again. You've never done it before. Uh, you go to school, right? School's a learning curve. College is a learning curve. We got yeah. some, uh, some of the campus ministry here yeah. tonight. Woo! All right. yeah, you learn. You learn some things in college, not just in the classroom, but about yourself, right? You learn a lot. Uh, how about marriage? You got any marrieds in the house? Yeah. Uh, you know, I know, especially our, our young marrieds. Come on, you you learn a lot in marriage. You learn a lot. You know, Dan and I we've only been married about two and a half years, but. Uh, it has certainly been a learning experience, you know, and we're just getting started. So, Jamie, give me a call if anything, right? <laughs> uh, how about uh, any parents in the house? Yes. Now, that's something that, uh, you know, we're not quite in that stage yet. But, but we, you know, we always say, I know it's going to be a whole nother chapter, a whole nother figuring things out, starting from ground zero. Yep. You know, but here's one thing I know all of us can relate to, maybe not parenting, but being a child and growing up. Yeah, amen. Yeah, how about that for a learning curve? Yeah. Right? Yeah. There was some tough spots. Amen. Yeah. High school, we got some teens in the house. Oh. All right. Yeah. You, know what I'm about? Ah, you know, being a teenager can be tough because you're figuring things out for like the first time, like life. Yeah. Like it really starts to set in. Yeah. Right? You you start to kind of come out of that like life's a Disney movie and you actually start to have responsibilities and like hard stuff happens, like stuff yeah. we don't like sometimes. Um, you know, and I bet a lot of us maybe had some awkward stages growing up, right? Yeah. You know, and, and some, you know, maybe had some phases and stages of, you know, maybe we don't dress the same as we used to. We don't say the same things that we used to. Maybe there were some things we were really into then that we're not so much now because we're figuring it out, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's good. It's okay. And, uh, you know, I'll say there's definitely some, some tough spots and awkward moments, even in planting a church for the first time. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. Because we're figuring it out, yeah. right? Even this last year in Syracuse, maybe yeah. you guys had some low points. Yeah. Maybe you had some challenging moments. Yeah. But you know what? That's okay because you're here today and you're stronger for yeah. it, amen? Yeah. Yeah. It's a fight. And God teaches us through those most challenging moments, sometimes the most powerful lessons that yeah. shape who we become. Yeah. So that. this lesson tonight on growth by the Spirit is all about really digging into those moments yeah. and looking ahead at what 2022 will bring for the church right. and bring for each one of you in your own growth. Yeah. Now, um, turn the page here. <laughs> so I'm working off uh, my wife's beautiful notes. Tonight. <laughs> uh, a little bit different than my usual style of note taking, but it's, it's, it's very pretty. So, <laughs> um, so yes, figuring things out, that's pretty much uh, discipleship, right? Yes. Constantly learning how to, figuring out how to be more like Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Uh, learning how to live by the spirit of God instead of 
the spirit of the flesh, mm. the spirit of the world, yeah. living by our own spirits. Yeah. There is certainly a learning curve to this. Yeah. If uh, you haven't figured that out. Yeah. Uh, you don't come into the kingdom just mature, ready. No. You just get baptized and you're Jesus. Mm. Right? I wish it was that way, but man, it's, it's far from it. You know? Some of us more than others. Amen. <laughs> And um, you know, turn with me here to a scripture in First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter thirteen. Cool. And in verse eleven, it's Paul speaking, and uh, he too can relate to the learning curve of discipleship. <laughs> And he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Amen. You see, Paul, too, had some awkward stages, I'm sure, just like the rest of us. He was just a human. But he grew from it. And reflecting back, there's some lessons that he pulls from it. Now, of course, uh, if you guys know about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, This chapter is about love. And he's calling the church to leave their childish ways behind them to grow and mature and to learn how to love like Jesus. Now, uh, if you turn here to verse 2, Paul reminds the church, If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and of knowledge and, and faith and I can move mountains, But I do not have love. I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Man, Paul describes here that we could go after all kinds of things in our discipleship. We could become the the best Bible talk leaders anybody has ever seen. You could become more knowledgeable in your Bible than yeah. you've ever been than anybody you know. On, Debate any denomination, any yeah. pastor, be able to line them up with scriptures and, and prove the gospel to yeah. them. You can uh, be amazing at sharing your faith, be yeah. having incredible quiet times. Yeah. But if you don't have love, yeah. you have nothing. Yeah. Man. I mean, think about that. You could literally... Be the most incredible disciple that anybody's ever seen on paper. Even have the stats and the resume to back it up. But if you miss this one thing, it's all for nothing. The first point is exactly that. Without love, we have nothing. To not grow in love is to not mature as a disciple. It's to not be a disciple. And of course, you know, this passage that details what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It's not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. not self-seeking. Not easily angered. Keeps no records of wrong. It do- does not delight in evil or rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Yeah. Yeah. That is the fruit and the work of the Spirit of God. Yeah. This is what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us. And trying to help us to live out in all the ways that we do discipleship. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to give you guys this little, uh, uh, a parable, if you will. Okay. Come on. Um, I think it's a fun parable. It's a little bit different. (laughs) Uh, You're different. So it's okay. How many of us love, love dogs? Oh, yeah. I do. Yeah. I love dogs. Uh, I love uh, David Jill's dog. Got a dog we were hanging out before we came over uh, here earlier today when we arrived. Uh, Dave and I were thinking about getting a dog. In, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and, you know, we were thinking about going to the shelter and, and getting a dog. Exactly. You know, this that's awesome. You want to rescue the dogs. So there's, you know, there's one of stray, sometimes there's some strays running around Philly and things like that. And one of our friends got an incredible dog from the shelter. It's awesome. And um, you know, uh, uh, shelters are incredible because they do take a dog who would have likely died on the streets. Yeah. Or maybe was abandoned. 
Yeah. And they give them a home. Yeah. They give them food. They keep them warm. They essentially save them from the life that was yeah. quite dismal. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the shelter, you go to pick out a dog, and there's usually like two types of dogs that you see in yeah. the kennels. And there's those kind of like vicious mangy looking dogs, you know, that are kind of like a little snappy or skittish or, you know, they still kind of got that, that uh, street vibe to them. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> and then there's maybe the dogs that, that uh, you know, have, have kind of acclimated to being in the shelter and they realize they're in a safe place now and they're kind of friendly and, and they run up and, they, you know, they want to uh, interact with you and give yeah. you attention. And it's awesome. Now, which of those two dogs most likely will get adopted? So I know the friendly one, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. you don't want that uh, that first one. It's they're not nice. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Maybe you you have some interactions with this type of dog. <laughs> That's not good. Um, <laughs> when people are looking to adopt a dog, they want a dog that can become part of their family, yeah. right? So, um, you know, they want a dog that, that they can grow with, that's going to love them, that they can show affection to as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that other one is it's just not quite that. <laughs> so here's the, the parable, guys. Um, we are the dogs mm -hmm. in the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, the kingdom is the shelter. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, we come into the kingdom of God and we get saved from our life of darkness and pain and abandonment in yeah. the world. Yeah. And we come in and we're safe and there's food, and there's warmth, and there's love available to yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. But some of us, we don't learn how to, to change yeah. from that mangy street dog <laughs> into a dog that can accept the love and become part of the family. Wow, talk about it. Mm -hmm. Right there's a there's a transition that has to happen for us. There's a, a shedding of the spirit of the world mm -hmm. and an accepting yeah. of the spirit of God. Wow. Mm -hmm. We have to learn how to love yeah. again. Mm -hmm. wow. Right? And and we go through a lot in the world. Right? Yeah. It's tough and you can yeah. carry a lot of that with you even yeah. though you're not in that environment anymore. Yeah. So um you know of course we're saved. You're saved. You're in the kennel, you're saved, but some of us have not changed. Oh. We have not grown. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we're limited in how much God can show us and to how much love we can receive and how much love we can give because we haven't accepted that spirit that has been given to us completely. Yeah. We haven't embraced it, we haven't allowed it to grow. Yeah. You know, we come into the kingdom kicking, fighting, biting. <laughs> Hopefully not fighting uh, physically, but, you know, getting a little snap. And maybe your discipler, or maybe somebody says something in a funny way to you, or someone who you're sharing your faith with doesn't respond the right way, you snap at them. Right? <laughs> we still kind of got that, that street vibe to us, you know? We got to shake it up. Right? We, don't, we come in, we don't trust anybody, because maybe we've been abandoned or, or kicked up to the curb. That's why how we ended up in the world in the first place, right? And we have to carry these bad attitudes and bad habits that we learn in the world into the kingdom. Mm. So, you know, just I'll leave that for you to reflect on of, of what, uh, which of the two dogs that you most resonate with in the kingdom. <laughs> now, what are some of the habits that maybe uh, you haven't quite changed yet? What are the things that hold you back from giving your heart and really being in a place where you can accept the love given to you and you can really be adopted into the family? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Dale. Okay. Yeah. I'm super, super excited to be here tonight. Um, and I really love this analogy or parable, um, if you will, because I think we can all relate to one of these dogs. And so just to help us all out, um, I kind of have here, like, what are some ways to know whether we're the mangy dog okay. or, you know, like, go lucky, grateful for my salvation oh, and shelter, right, and rescuing from the world, dog, right? Oh, so the first one is a lack of humility and submission to your discipler or spiritual mentor would make you a mangy dog, oh, <laughs> right? So, and I, again, I think we can all relate to this, right? Yeah. You know, uh, always defensive maybe you know uh not prioritizing that time to, oh i'm sorry something came up since i just you know uh, well I, maybe we could just reschedule 
So not having a reverence and a, and a gratitude for the time to get with your spiritual mentor, mm-hmm. refusing to accept the discipling. I got mm-hmm. just actually don't think you're right about that. I don't think that's mm-hmm. really my problem or, you know, I actually don't think I struggle with that. You know, um, I, I actually think it's this thing. If you could just help me with this thing, then I'm sure I will, I will be okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's, you know, like Nick said, a little snappy confrontational, <laughs> maybe, right? Or doing the opposite thing of what you were about, right? Maybe that that um, self reliance, aka pride. Um, but again, I think we can all struggle with this. But you know, the danger in this is it keeps us from, like we talked about, maturing in our love, right? It really keeps us from maturing and growing into the identity of Christ, and much like. Uh, these two different uh, types of dogs, um, one will be adopted into the family and one will not, right? So we have to take this very seriously. And so a challenge for you, if you can relate to that, is mm-hmm. to give your heart fully and completely to the person that God has put in your life to guide you spiritually. And a practical on how to do that is to apply and submit to the advice you are being given. So actually do it. I think sometimes, and I can even, you know, when I'm unspiritual, have these thoughts, well, it's just that thought, so it's not like I have to really do, you know, Um, but the submission is to consider it, and out of my trust and love for God, actually apply it. Um, The second one is being independent, you know, um, I am the only girl of three brothers, so I very much so developed uh, independent, strong kind of, you know, character about myself. And coming into the kingdom, I actually had to learn how or renew my mind in how to be interdependent. Um, I kind of thought of that as like weak or like I'm, I don't want to be a burden. I, like, I fought so hard to kind of like figure things out on my own. Um, but coming into the kingdom, I had to renew my mind of what it actually means to give my heart um, in a manner of submission and interdependency that it wasn't a sign of weakness, but it was a sign of humility. Um, And I think some of the ways that this can kind of manifest is not seeking counsel. So just kind of like doing, you know, whatever you may or you want to do, not getting open completely. I just talking about this, you know, and uh, this is kind of reserved uh, for the side, you know, or maybe it's withholding your heart. You know, Nick talked about the the different types of dogs and how one of them just really struggles to trust. You know, to, to trust and accept and believe that I can actually be loved. And I know as women, that can be something that we struggle with is, can someone really love me? Because the world is so messed up. We come in with so much baggage, with so much pain and, and insecurity and, and, and rejection. And then we bring it to the, into the kingdom it prevents us from really giving our hearts mm-hmm. or really letting someone in. You know, do we talk about the struggles? You know, do we talk about what, uh, what our weaknesses are? Are we truly vulnerable and transparent about what's really going on internally? You know, so yeah. my challenge, if you resonate with that, is to get advice about it. Yeah. You know, don't don't hold back. Um, to really give your heart and go after getting advice about every area of your life. And then the last one is a lack of building deep friendships in the kingdom. You know, for me, came into the kingdom, it's like, look, I'm here for the gospel, not for you. Um, and uh, I don't need relationships, this is just honest, don't need relationships. I understand my purpose is to make disciples and that's why I'm here. Um, and I did not have the, the love of God in the way that I viewed relationships because a lot of my relationships in the world, I could not rely on counsel. Mm-hmm. So I did not invest in building. Mm-hmm. And I had to really change my heart and how I viewed sisterhood, how I viewed family. I mean, I don't know about you, but I know I kind of came from a dysfunctional family. Yeah. And so my, my understanding of family is very skewed. Yeah. And so coming into the kingdom, I had to relearn one, the importance of family and how to build family. And I'm so yeah. grateful of the women that God put in my life to really help me persevere through all the snappiness. And that was definitely a mangy dog, you know, <laughs> at one point uh, uh, in my discipleship. But I'm so grateful for God's love, right? I'm so grateful for his love. And so 
Um, I think sometimes, again, when we lack that trust, it keeps us from building deep relationships, which, which then affects um, how we give for the kingdom. And we cannot prioritize times together, uh, whether it be fellowship, whether it be uh, different meetings that we have in the church, uh, or whether it be just getting time with uh, sisters and, and building relationships. I think sometimes we end up holding on to those bad relationships in the world um, and forsaking building new ones for fear that we won't be accepted. Mm-hmm. So if you also struggle with that, a practical is to find someone to share. Find someone mm-hmm. to serve and give your heart to. Um, and also to find someone um, or talk to your discipler about a way that you can serve and build up the team of God. So, ladies, I hope that was helpful. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, awesome. Thank you, uh, Dale, for sharing that stuff. And brothers, uh, I second all those challenges. <laughs> <laughs> There's no sidestep in that one. Um, <laughs> but I have one more for you on, on these points and practicals of how we can grow in our love uh, by the Spirit of God. And it's kind of a part two to building deep friendships within the kingdom. It's also building deep friendships with those that you're studying the Bible with. Uh, you know, the, the kingdom of God is God's family, as, as they are talking about, as we all know, have a conviction about. Uh, but uh, I want to ask you, does everybody in the church feel like family to you? Does everybody in the church feel like you are family to them? Right? If, if, if you ask any random person, maybe somebody you don't talk to you very much, uh, if they feel loved by you, would they say yes? And I, I think if they can't say that, but if they can't say I feel loved by any random person in the church, then, then there's an area for growth. Yeah. So we're yeah. going to go yeah. after that. Yeah. Uh, and even more so, turn with me here to, to uh, John chapter 13. Uh, why this is so important, not only for the strength and unity of the family of God's family, but also for those who are seeking out God's family. Yeah. In John 13, verse 34, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. <laughs> By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If, if you love one another. Yeah. So right here, Jesus lets the disciples know, before they even begin building the church without him, that this is going to be the trademark quality of a Christian. And this not only is going to keep the unity of the body, but also when people come into the church and they see this law, it'll make them want to become disciples also. Yeah. Right? So we have to have that love not only for each other, but for the lost. Yeah. For the lost. You know, when we have a, an incredible family, we want to bring people into it. Yeah. Sure. Right, but sometimes, uh, and maybe some of us get into this. My family can be a little bit spicy as well sometimes, and I'm not so good with. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes I'm like a little bit like, I don't know if I want to bring you back to meet my family for this particular occasion. <laughs> you know, does anybody relate to that? Like, I don't know what's going to happen, but it might not be good. <laughs> right. So, two different impacts that a good family can have. One that is really loving and incredible and awesome. People want to be a part of that. Yeah. When they come into a family that's kind of like messed up and they can feel just the awkwardness and, and these undertones of, of whatever might be going on, yeah. people don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. You know, so we, we got to love in a way that is going to astound people, yeah. where the only explanation is that there is a God and Jesus is his son. Yeah. Amen? Amen? This is the impact that our love should have, uh, not only for ourselves, but for a lost world. You know, this is one thing that uh, I think has been awesome in family to develop in our our uh, Bible talks. Yeah. And this is really where people get a taste of the kingdom. They can see that love at the most basic level of them coming out and having interaction with the church. Like before they even come to church, they can notice there's something different about this group. Yeah. And they want to be a part of this. Yeah. It's been incredible to have uh, our, our, we call them uh, life talks. With our campus ministry movement on, at yeah. Temple University, UPenn, and Drexel University. Yeah. And what's been awesome is that there are students who come out every single week, multiple times a week, to our discussions just because they love the group. Yeah. They feel that and they want to be a part of it. Yeah. And I'm talking like people who are atheists, yeah. people who, who are just totally like in their own little world and have all this other stuff going on. But there's something about the group that they're drawn to. Yeah. And I believe it's God softening their heart through his love and through his spirit. Yeah. And it's seen and felt and experienced.
Let's take the Bible. We try, trust me, we try. <laughs> but they still want to hang out with us, so we hang out with them. We spend time with them. We don't write somebody out because they don't want to study the Bible. Maybe they're a slow cooker. How many of us are slow cookers? <laughs> so we're sitting there a little while, right? And sometimes those are the most powerful conversions because they're looking to see if the mob is real. Yeah. 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 And when they finally see it from your persistence and your long suffering and your laying down your life, then they see this is the love of God. Yeah. And they become Christians. So uh, the challenge here to close out this point is, uh, if nothing else in 2022, grow in your love. If nothing else, and guys, as the scriptures say, like you could gain everything else and it wouldn't be worth anything yeah. without love. Yeah. So uh, learn how to trust your discipling partner. Give them your hearts. You know, Dale said something really awesome. Trust them because you trust God. Yeah. yeah. Right. Follow the scriptures on this. Mm -hmm. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Crucify your independent spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says there's a way that seems right to man or woman, but in the end it leads to death. Mm -hmm. Right. Independent spirit is is really a serious, dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, guys, uh, give your hearts. View the church as your family for real yeah. and build deep relationships that will last a lifetime and that will change the people around you. Amen. Uh, turn over here, guys, to John chapter 12. Uh, one more point, and we'll close out with this one here. Come on. So, John chapter 12, and in verse 24, I'm going to start in verse 23, give you a little context here. Uh, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus is about to go to the cross. Verse 24, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat that falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Uh, uh, well, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Yeah. It's a very powerful passage. Yeah. Uh, our second point here is sowing is growing. Sowing is growing. And, you know, here, this is, is basically the pinnacle of Jesus's ministry. Yeah. You can say he's reached maturity at this point. It is the height of his, his time on earth. And the spirit of God leads him to death on a cross. Pretty intense. Yeah. You know, in, in his most powerful moments, this is the next step. Death on the cross. Why? Well, we all know the result here. It produced a harvest, a crop of righteousness that saved countless souls, including each one of ours here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? It was it was not without effect. In fact, it was the greatest impact. It was the most defining example of love the world yes. has ever seen yes. the spirit called jesus to die mm -hmm. jesus reflecting on this he's struggling with it he's having a hard time you know it, it, in verse 27 it says my my soul is now troubled and what shall i say father save me from this hour no it was for this very reason that i came mm -hmm. father glorify your name Amen. Man, he's tempted to like step back from that. Yeah. To, to, to maybe reason away the calling of God in his life to lay down his very self. Yeah. But he doesn't. And the results, of course, is that we're standing here today talking about it 2,000 yeah. years later. Yeah. So here's the thing, guys. In, in, in the same way, the Spirit of God leads us to die to ourselves every single day. Yeah. Why? Why would God call us to such such a, uh, a challenge? Yeah. To the pain and the suffering. Well, we know, church, from the passage here, it's the only way to produce a crop. Yeah. It's the only way that others will be saved. Yeah. It's the only way, way that they can hear the word, that you can build this incredible family, is if first you're willing to lay down your life to die, yeah. to produce that crop of righteousness. Yeah. Come on. You give up, uh, for example, and we know this even in a worldly sense, uh, as in our own growth, growth uh, as people, right? You go from singlehood, and then when you mature a little bit, you get married. 
Yeah. Right now, at marriage, you, you yeah. give up some of your freedom. You give up some of that independent spirits that you once had. Yep. Yeah. Right? So some of us are not ready for that. And <laughs> <laughs> you're wondering what's taking so long. So then once you're you're married for some time, and that's a, that's a sign of maturity, then the next step is is of course we talked about you have some kids. Yeah. Right? And what happens then? Will you give up a little bit more of your freedom? <laughs> right? we're, we're not quite ready for that yet. I don't think so. I like this. I, I don't know. You know, cuts into the time, the finances. You know, that you lose a com some comfortability there when you decide. To lay down that part of your life, but what happens is it is it produces life. Yes. Yeah, you create family. Yeah, right. It's the same way as disciples. If we aren't bearing fruit in our discipleship, it's a sign of immaturity. We don't want to give up that comfort and that freedom in the space that we're holding on to here. Yeah. Oh, you know, uh, there's a saying, once saved, always saved. We know that's not true. Oh, yeah. But I'll tell you this. There's also a saying that I'll put before you today. is uh, It's not once mature, always mature. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 So you could have at one time been mature and bearing fruits. And you see, discipleship is not like physical aging. You can actually regress and become less mature. And then you stop bearing fruits. Right, and it's like you you went you know from from thirty five back to eighteen. Um, right, terrible. that that actually that can happen. Yeah, in your right. our discipleship. <coughs> um, church, you know, there's uh, uh we're looking at some stats. There's four hundred and twenty one thousand people in Syracuse. Is that half a million people? It's a lot of people, and all those people are counting on you to show them the truth. Oh, my. They're counting on you to lay down your life so that they can come into the kingdom as well. They can be part of that family also. You know, we know, church, that the road is narrow and few find it. And wide is the road that leads to destruction? 421,000 people. There's 61 in the church? 64. 64. Guys, the road is narrow. Wow. Few will find it. But you have the answers. You have the kingdom. You have yeah. the spirit of God. Right? If you don't tell them, how can they hear? Right? The kingdom is like a pearl hidden in a field. you got to show people the way. Yeah. What can you do to bring people into the kingdom of God? Yeah. What can you do to sow that seed to die to yourself so that other people can hear the message and can yeah. know about this? Don't let, you know, Syracuse uh, has done some incredible things. Yeah. It's yeah. it's like renowned in the kingdom for all the awesome evangelists that have come from here, incredible miracles that have come from here. But uh, church, don't let the miracles of the past define Syracuse. Right? Wow, let the miracles of the future define wow. Syracuse. Wow. So what can you do? In this place? Yeah, yeah. I really, I really love that Nick shared that. And, you know, reflecting um just on my time in Philly and you know he talks about how as disciples I think sometimes we can be deceived um, or forget how much we're needed in the world um, I know in um, Philly there's like this culture um, of apathy you know and I believe that a lot of it is due to just the state of things as, as many people know Philly has one of the highest crime rates um, as well as death rates, as well as drug overdoses or drug related crimes. And I believe because the, because of the extreme oppression it has produced in the, the Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia people, a spirit of numbness just completely checked out. Um, and then you have the other end where you have people who are just overly comfortable so comfortable that they're not necessarily happy, but they're content. And I think sometimes we can, and I found myself just kind of, well, you know, it doesn't really seem like they want God. They, they, you know, it seems like they don't really care. And then their apathy can become my apathy. Mm -hmm. Their lack of concern for themselves. And they go, well, this can be And so I had to really examine my heart when they said, what can you do? What will you do? Um, because people are depending on you. 
I really had to stop and reflect and make sure that I am not being a barrier to people's salvation. Mm -hmm. That that what I see is not affecting my faith. Mm -hmm. And their responses aren't affecting my love. You know, and I think of um, like the culture of Syracuse, you guys probably know this better than I, you know, but I mean, probably most have come from New York City for a particular reason of, you know, maybe comfort (laughs) Um, and getting away from that city life, you know, um, kind of slowing things down a little bit, building family. And while that's great, it can also produce comfort. I just want to, you know, and and, and maybe a question to ask is just, have I become comfortable? You know, when I started reflecting on my like, I become comfortable, just like a numbness, like I'm sharing my faith, but am I really going the extra? You know, and I think some some ways in which we can examine our tail if we slip back into comfort is how active I, am I in saving the lost? Am I in Bible studies? Do I go out of my way? to get with women to study the Bible? Do I go out of my way to pray with the woman studying the Bible? Or is it just, oh, they're studying, okay, I pray for you, but then completely get distracted and just don't pray for that person? Or, you know what, let me invite this woman who's struggling, not really open as a yet to study the Bible into my home to share my heart with her. Like, what is my heart to do, like we said, whatever I can for someone to come to know Jesus, you know? Um, what is my heart towards the family, the fellowship, the meetings of the body? This is something that I prioritize or would I rather be on? Mm-hmm. You know, I think that the pandemic uh, did a lot in that way of kind of making the gospel comfortable. Yeah. And we know that the gospel is not comfortable. It is the most uncomfortable, <laughs> um, you know, teachings. Um, but is my heart pulling back from being radical? Right. It's my heart pulling back and wanting to be more icy. Oh, I don't know if I can lead or come out or, you know, can I just zoom it? You know, and I had to make sure for myself, like, where is my heart? You know, and going after it and realizing that I can't allow what I see and the culture of, of, of my environment or the sin of my body to sit back into my seat back into my discipleship because it was sit back into the um, and so I think if you are struggling or if you find yourself kind of getting back into that comfort, get, get open with, you know, your disciples, you know, find ways to be radical. One of the things that um, I'm really grateful and happy that we're going to be doing um, in Philadelphia is once a month, we are going to be having um, mercy events. And, um, but we're going to kind of turn it into like a Bible talk. And so what we're going to do is, is we're going to get out in the, into the community um, in some of the roughest areas to kind of wake people up to the reality of what people um, are going through, the suffering people are going through, because, again, that spirit of that. Um, and so like, we got to really wake people up. Yes. Um, and yeah. so one of the things that uh, is going to really, I believe, make this special is after each mercy event, we're going to have a time of reflection. And we're going to have a script and we're going to have a teaching on, hey, this is what people are going to do physically. Nice. So what about you? How are you spiritual? And really help people connect, you know, the dots that are physical um, is just as important as our spiritual. Yeah. Um, so as Nick shared, like, what will you do for the women here in Syracuse? And how um, uncomfortable are you willing to be so that the women in Syracuse can come to know God? Guys, just uh, kind of coming for a landing here. Um, you know, there's an awesome quote that says, uh, you've probably heard this, but um, the comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. Yeah. Wow. Right? So, as disciples, we got to be comfortable with getting uncomfortable. We got to be comfortable with dying to ourselves, which is probably the most uncomfortable thing that we could think of doing. Like, literally, death. You got to be comfortable with staying in that place and operating from that place. And that's where the spirit really works on our hearts and allows us to actually find comfort and find peace, find security and joy on the edge of our faith. Yeah. And that's where we grow the most. Yeah. Yeah. Growth given by the spirits as mature disciples looks like making disciples. Yeah. yeah. Right. We have to sow 
to grow, mm-hmm. lay down our lives so that others can learn from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is building family once again. And right? we got to be willing to not look to our own interests, but the interests of those around us. Yeah. That's maturity. That's maturity. That's wanting to disciple somebody else. That's wanting to pull yourself out so that somebody can come into the kingdom. Mm-hmm. It's desiring and learning how to get better at that all the time. Yeah. But when we fight growing for maturity, <laughs> We fight doing those things. We quench the spirit of God within us, mm. right? That's what God wants to do. Yeah. His whole plan is to get out there and save as many as possible. And when we don't make that our purpose, we stop the Holy Spirit from using us to see God's miracles happen in our life and lives of the lives of the people around us. Yeah. Yeah. And man, that's what makes Christianity so much fun and so exciting and worth it is to see that happening yeah. through you. Yeah. I mean, it's it's amazing. What are we doing if not for that? Yeah. yeah. You know, I've learned a lot in my time in Philly through discipling and, and through uh, uh, Bible studies with people and reaching out to the lost. And some of the biggest milestones in my growth have been through the relationships I've had with other people, yeah. the disciples and the non-disciples. Yeah. Right. So, you know, sometimes we get so focused on ourselves and our own shortcomings that we sort of say, say ah, I can't really help anybody else. But really, the spirit of God is leading us to those other people to help us figure out ourselves. Yeah. 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 Right. So this is a lot of the time how the spirit operates. So, uh, guys, let's go after that. Let's yeah. serve others and produce growth. Um, well, as you guys know, uh, 2022. Let it be a blowout year for Syracuse. Yeah. Let it be the most uh, incredible growth you've all seen individually and that you've seen that the church has ever seen as well. Yeah. Syracuse is in a good spot right now. and Maybe you just got through that adolescent stage. Maybe you just got into that singlehood. And it's time to, to get married, so to speak. It's on producing a crop of righteousness. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Y